Hello, everybody, and welcome to this talk, Databases in the Jamstack. My name is Cassidy Williams. You can find me at Cassidy most places on the internet. Um, and I'm a principal developer experience engineer at Netlify. I'm really excited to talk to you today about this concept because I think a lot of people are aware of Jamstack concepts and aware of database things, but not as much on how well they play together. And so first of all, I just wanna talk about the Jamstack because a lot of times people are just like, isn't that just building websites? And it kind of is. Uh, so the term for Jamstack uh, was first presented in 2016 by Matt Billman, Netlify CEO. And uh, it was introduced as JavaScript APIs and markup. And it was a way of architecting your sites in a way where, where sites were hosted on CDNs and, and they were pre-built upfront. And the term went from Jamstack with the capital J-A-M to Jamstack uh, in 2020 for flexibility because yes, it's still JavaScript APIs and markup, but you can do a lot more dynamic things with your Jamstack sites that isn't just necessarily strictly static. It might be static first in a lot of ways in how you host it, but it's, it's a little bit different from that. And so first of all, JavaScript. All dynamic functionalities that you might have in your sites are handled by JavaScript. There's no restrictions on how much JavaScript that you use. There's no restrictions on which frameworks you use, which libraries you use. It's just JavaScript, and the, and it's it's what you use for all dynamic aspects um, of the site on the on the front. APIs are for server side operations. Um, they're abstracted into reusable APIs and accessed over HTTPS with JavaScript. They can be third party services where you're pulling in data, or they could be your own custom function. And that's where it can get really, really powerful, where you can write functions in Node, in Go, in Rust, and in, in all kinds of different languages and use that API to add that kind of server functionality to your sites. And then finally, with markup, it's it's sites that are served as generated HTML. That's that's what's given to the user. But again, that's that's JavaScript APIs and markup. But what about that flexibility thing that I mentioned? I think the easiest way to really describe it is you're compiling as much as you can upfront and then pulling in as much data as you can as needed. Now, when you when you think of it this way, this is how it, it made the, the most sense to me. When you're thinking about mobile applications, iOS, Android, Windows Phone, rest in peace. When you're thinking about these mobile applications, you have these apps that are mostly compiled. You're, you're using these languages like Java, like Swift, like Kotlin, these languages where you compile an app together. And then whenever you want to get information from the internet data that is pulled in, that happens when you're actually using the app, when you're actually running the app. But otherwise, it's mostly compiled up front. You can still load quite a bit on these mobile apps without an internet connection. It's kind of similar that way with Jamstack, where you're kind of treating the browser as an operating system, where you're compiling as much as you can up front and then pulling in data as needed. And by doing it this way, it it's not necessarily a new concept. None of this is new. Uh, we we uh, build sites this way to be able to add the kind of flexibility and treating the browser as an operating system to be able to reframe how sites can be built. Sites have been built this way for a long time. We have better technology now, but none of, none of these concepts are completely mind blowing. We're, they're borrowed from a lot of different places. It's all about reducing complexity and increasing portability. Everything lives in Git for easy cloning and deployments. What's really nice about this is I don't necessarily need a container to be able to run a Jamstack site. I should be able to just clone it and, and, and run it locally. Um, and then Scaling and performing is much better too, because as much as pre-built as possible, so you don't have to worry as much about your site being DDoSed. Um, a really fun example of this is a friend of mine, her startup decided to switch their site to a Jamstack approach just to see how it might work. And she works with a lot of live streamers and there was a point where they had this form that was being run with a serverless function and, and triggered. And 
normally their site kind of struggled whenever they would have a big streaming event where they had thousands and thousands of people filling out the form at the exact same time. But by doing it in the Jamstack approach, because all of the JavaScript was built up front, all, all of the site was built up front, it was just the serverless function that was being pinged, their site had no latency whatsoever because it was just built as much up front you didn't need to serve extra JavaScript to actually load the page. It wasn't server side rendered. And all of the data was still submitted because she was using serverless functions for that. So it's very, very exciting. I, I love this concept and it's very cool. Um, but I've been talking a lot about that. Where the heck do databases come in? Now, uh, databases thrive on that API later, layer, the, the A part of Jamstack. And uh, you can kind of reframe the question where what if accessing a database is like working with a data API? Your servers don't, or your users don't necessarily need to access the data directly, but instead you can build an API kind of like with a serverless function or, or with built-in functionality from your databases, and then use that to connect to the database. And by doing it this way, you don't necessarily need to think about DevOps, you don't necessarily need to think about containers, which I really like to not have to deal with. You don't need to think about any of that. I can still be in my front end developer comfort zone while still doing really complex, dynamic, data driven apps without feeling like I have to learn an entirely new skill set. And that's that's really, really powerful. And, and it's all about decoupling your services and decoupling all, all of your information. By cleanly separating my database from my site via an API, rather than deeply integrating it uh, into my systems, I can more easily reason about all of the different parts. If I have a database living out somewhere and a CMS elsewhere, and maybe authentication living somewhere in between my design system being pulled in via data, treating everything like an API, each of these components can be swapped out with and upgraded easily without taking down everything at once. And you can kind of have specialists on your team focus on very different parts of your application and do all of their updating. And as long as the API aspect of it works, that's that's all that really matters. And it's a, it's a really powerful modular way of thinking that will help your site scale really well and help you be able to for example, let's just say you want to change your database to a different service or change your CMS to a, to a different service or something like that. You can just do that and not have to worry about taking down your entire site or redoing um, a bunch of code. Okay, so that that's 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 most of the slides I have for you. Now I want to go through a quick demo just to explain how I do this really quickly in, in an application. And so. If you'd like to jump over to cast.run slash adventure, this is an application that I made a while ago and I've, I've updated here and there, but a, a lot of these core concepts are the same. And so let me switch over to that really quick right now. Okay, so this is an application that I made and it's it's called a lonely code filled night. And it's it's kind of just a fun application I made that that is using Next.js. It's using xState for state management using Netlify forms for, for submitting forms, and it's using serverless functions in Hasura and, and using all of that to query a database. Um, so in, in this application, I can click Get Spooky, and it'll let me go through this choose your own adventure story. And so I can say, once upon a time, there's a developer named Solar who's working very late at night, very late at night on Halloween. You can tell when I first wrote this story. Um, Solar decided to take a break to get a snack. He went to the kitchen and couldn't decide what to eat. We could eat some candy. He munched on the candy, enjoying the delightful thought of getting a cavity someday. But then the, outside the doorbell rang. Trick or treat echoed outside. We're going to answer the door. He opened the front door, but nobody was there. It was spooky, but probably good since his stomach had the last of the candy. We'll ask if anyone is out there. He called out into the night, who's there? Suddenly a werewolf, a werewolf comes up and says, have you heard of TypeScript and eats him? The end. Ooh. So this is, this is just a silly little story, but I wanted, to, I wanted to kind of show how this all works. Now, this character named Solar is not the same character that you will always see when you load up this website. And that's because it's being pulled in from a database and that uh, database is being queried with a serverless function. So I'm gonna show one more thing before I go into the code and have you look at it. There's also a way to contribute a character. 
And so I mentioned we're using Netlify forms. You can populate this with a character name, uh, pronouns that they have, their character's favorite smell in your email. And then when you hit send, that triggers a serverless function that then hits a database and then populates the database with that character's information. And then when you go home, you can then uh, go again through the story and see all of that. So if I were to go into the code now, you can check this out. Again, it's cast.run slash adventure or under cast do my GitHub and it's next adventure. And so in this code, we have all the different pages that, that populates the story and stuff. I won't get into that too deeply, but what I do want to touch on is the serverless functions here. Now these serverless functions are directly interacting with my database. And so if I do get character.js, this one right here, um, this is run whenever the, the site is run at first and we're querying get characters and then it passes all of this information in to my site and it's just an API call that I made. And in get characters, this is where I'm querying Hasura and it's a GraphQL function. I'm just pulling the data in from my database that way. And if I were to go to the other serverless function, oops, sorry about that, my page froze for a second. If I were to go to submission created, this is actually a magic function name on Netlify, which is kind of fun. Whenever you use a Netlify form and submit it, submission created.js is automatically pinged if it exists. And so it's a nice little thing to hook up to your forms. Um, but anyway, let's just say you hit that uh, submission created. We have this exports handler, and that takes in the form data, the name, the gender, the smell. And then we, we add that character to the database. And then this, again, is an API call. And it, and it gets all of my keys. And then it passes that to my database this way. Um, and this is, this is really, really exciting because we're, we're reading from the database and we're also, uh, we're also passing to the database all with serverless functions. Serverless functions in general have a lower operational overhead than managing full-blown servers. So the setup and maintenance takes a lot less time. And as you can see, these are two files, these, these two uh, JavaScript functions. And it's really, really exciting to see. And uh, these secure credentials here, you might've seen that I have this uh, process.m Hasura admin right here. Um, and then we have the Hasura URL and stuff. Um, these credentials are protected with environment variables. So our functions can make secure requests without uh, having to expose any keys publicly to our database. Um, and these, these serverless functions are built to automatically scale with increased traffic. And so I, again, I don't have to deal with DevOps. I don't have to deal with those kinds of burdens. I can just have my team or, or myself ship faster without having to have extra overhead when, when running these functions. I, I think this is so powerful and so cool. And so uh, really quick, I wanna show you what the database looks like. And so this is my Hasura database right here. And this is what has, been populated from the form. It's it's a fairly simple table where there is a, someone named Zombie and they had masculine pronouns and their favorite smell was flesh. And then Lindsay is feminine and likes the smell of success. You didn't see the smell in the story, but you know that was there. Um, so anyway, I get all of this data from uh, from those serverless functions, and then later when I want a random character, it's just pulled from this database. And I didn't have to do any extra configuration besides getting my keys, adding the environment variables, and making those two those two queries. And, and it's it's really, really exciting to see. And so I'll show you how these are, are queried really quick in the application before we start heading out. And so um, we have our different pages in the application. And in Next.js, there's an app.js, underscore app.js, and this wraps our entire application right here. And so this is just a big app context, and then that app context component is, is one that pulls in a bunch of data and passes it to our pages. And then the index.js, you don't need to see all of these pages. This is just the home page, and then the other pages are the form page and everything. And so that, that's, that's what those ones are. And so the pages aren't as exciting as the context in here. Now in the app context, this part is very, very cool. We have our nice gigantic context file right here. It's actually not that big. I, I bloated it in my mind. And so we have this use random character hook that I made that uses a use effect. And this is calling our serverless function right here. It's using get character and it pulls it from our API that we've made because that's, that's how 
our API works, and that's populating it from the database. And then it sets the character in the application. And then when I do that, that uh, passes it down into my story context. And then my story context is passed to the rest of the app. Now, um, and this is the story context right here. And when it's passed to the rest of the app, we get a state machine and generate pronouns. Generate pronouns, this is a quick library where I generate pronouns based on, on the gender that's passed in. And so it can make the story a little bit more specific. And so here, this is where our gigantic story is. And so because we have our, our different levels right here, this is these are all the different phases in X state of our whole choose your own adventure story. And so as we go, you can see like once upon a time, there was a developer named Name who was working very late at night on Halloween, the developer, and then you can see the generated pronouns and stuff, all, all pulled from that database in that one hook. Um, and now really quick, I'll show you the form that I had over there. And this is under components, character form. In here, because it's a Netlify form, again, I didn't need to actually call submission created anywhere. All I had to do was add this data Netlify equals true. And so that means that Netlify will automatically detect this form and then call that function as needed. And so um, whenever I submit this form, we've got the character name, the pronouns, and then the favorite smell, and then Again, that is passed to the database. So this is a very small example. It's a silly example, but this is an illustration of what you can do with a much larger application. Imagine if you had just a really dynamic application with auth authentication and users and user data. By having it use this serverless function way of doing things and having it live in the API layer of the Jamstack, that's when you can have really well scaling applications that a lot of people can use without you having to deal with a lot of overhead. That being said, thank you so much for your time today. I've been Cassidy Williams. Once again, you can find me at Cassidy all over the internet. And thank you so much for your time. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Cassidy. Thank you so much for that insightful and approachable talk. This was also our last talk for today. Ooh, we made it. It's been so yes. fun seeing all of the different talks today. Everyone has been so, so interesting. I've, I've genuinely enjoyed all of it. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. And I'm sure the audience also enjoyed your talk. Um, Thank you. We are going to do a live Q&A now. Are you ready to take some questions? I hope so. Let's go. Let's go. All right. Well, <laughs> to the audience, just be, uh, uh, you should know that you can drop your questions. I've said this many times today, but really, if you have questions, there's no such thing as a stupid question. So feel free to ask anything that, that might come to mind. And with that, let's get started. So the Jamstack architecture is pretty loosely defined and in many cases is associated with static generation. How would you compare the Jamstack architecture to say single page applications? Totally. And this is, I touched on a little bit in my talk, but it's definitely something that I'm just going to reiterate because it's, it's confusing. And it was something where when I was first learning about this term Jamstack, I was like, isn't this just making websites? It's <laughs> not particularly novel. I don't understand. Um, but it's, it's loosely defined, but it's also kind of just giving a name to not necessarily fully static sites, but static first sites. Where, where you build as much as you can up front and then pull in data as needed. And so I mentioned in my talk uh, a phone metaphor where when you look at phone apps, um, whether it's on iOS, Android, whatever, Windows phone, um, you, you pre-compile as much as you can up front and then you pull in the data as needed. And, and some of that data is pulled in up, up front and some of that data is pulled in when the user hits certain, certain parts of, of a page or, or of a part of the app. And it's incredibly similar with Jamstack apps where you are treating the browser like an operating system. You're pulling in as much as you can and then, um, and then populating it with data as needed. And so in a way, aspects of single page applications can be considered a, a Jamstack because you are compiling some things, but a lot of it is just coming in a, as, as a user requests it. Um, and so a really good example of this is actually just the Netlify website, um, where we, we have a few different aspects of where there's like the marketing portion of the website and then the app portion of the website. And that's using a bunch of different frameworks. We actually use, I think, Vue and Eleventy on the marketing side. And then once you get into the app, it uses React. And um, there's certain parts of 
the Netlify app that is pre-compiled, but then a lot of it is very single page application. Like, like we use React router and everything. And it's all still considered Jamstack because we do compile as much as we can up front, but then we have the users query things and, and, and pull data in as needed, pull routes in as needed and, and that sort of thing. I see. Thank you for that answer. Now, sort of moving on from this, many Jamstack libraries have this concept of hydration. Could you explain what this means? You know, it's really just a fancy word for pulling in data. <laughs> like you, you, and it, it can happen in, at different points of your application. But, but uh, for example, if you were to have a page that is mostly static, um, a, a good example of this, I, I don't know if you've seen the new Astro framework that just came out. Um, it's a, no, it's a very static first uh, framework. I think the website is astro.build. I've been playing with it all week and it's very interesting, but they they do very, very static first where um, it's, it's so static that like if you put a React component on the page, it won't be interactive at all. It'll just render onto the page unless you tell it to. Um, mm -hmm. But what's interesting is it has the hydration element where if you say, okay, as soon as the component is visible on the page or as soon as like certain data is loaded, then you can actually use it. That's an example of hydration because suddenly the, the data has been added to the page and, and is usable on the page. And so it's, it's really just a matter of being able to populate data as it, it is queried. I see. Now, in your talk, you demonstrated how easy it is to pull data using a serverless function that fetches data from essentially a stateless GraphQL API. How would you sort of compare this approach to one where you directly fetch data from a database using something like, for example, Prisma? For example, um, <laughs> well, and I, I, think, I think they both have such great use cases. Um, and and it really depends on on what you're using. And I think that they can actually work together in, in a lot of ways. It, it just kind of depends on what you want to do. Where um, with uh, serverless functions and 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 the the benefits of serverless functions, you can kind of hide your environment variables because you don't want anybody on on the front end to be able to access them. You can you can make sure that uh, you have that separation with with the API. But then with something like Prisma, you can kind of query a database anywhere and, and you can you can um, expose uh, environment variables if you want to you can exp uh, and and you can hide things at different levels and stuff and so it, I don't know if that's it's never really a fun way to just say it depends and kind of leave the answer that way but I I think I I think that depending on where you want to query your data and and how you want your data to be exposed and used and stuff there's there's those different use cases for both um, I tend to like using the serverless function approach when I don't want to run a node server, but I still want to have the benefits of a node server and, and, and pulling stuff in. But um, if I can query something client side, I really enjoy doing that because then I can just do a quick fetch and, and run things on the front end as well. But luckily with the technologies that we have today, a lot front end developers are really empowered to be able to write front end and back end code querying data and, and manipulating data without being uncomfortable about it because of these tools um, that, that let us do that. Absolutely. And what do you look forward to the most in the current web ecosystem? Oh, that's a good question because there, there's so many there's so many interesting things to look for. And what I what I appreciate about the web ecosystem is is because it grows so fast and, and is changing so much, people are very, very open to, to ideas and everything. And what I'm currently really excited about is some of the new build tools that are coming out. And so I've been playing a, a lot with Vite um, and Vite is just so fast and, and, and no shade to, to the wonderful folks and the wonderful technology of Webpack and stuff, but it feels like a game changer. And, and I'm really, really excited to see that and, and ES build. Um, really, really making a, a splash in, in the web dev ecosystem. And, and what I also am liking seeing is because of some of these build tools and, and a lot of these um, I, 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 tools, I, I, I keep saying, just developer tools that make it so it's very 
it solves just one problem really, really well, a lot of developers will be able to bring what they want to the table. And so, for example, um, I, I mentioned Astro. There's some aspects of 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 a uh, view that I like a lot, and there's some aspects of React that I like a lot. With Astro, I'm able to write both in the same code base because it just solves the problem of compiling the static pages. And then I can write my components however I want, where I can say, oh, well, if I want a component that can delete itself, I'll use Vue. But if I want to use something with lifecycle methods I'm comfortable with, I can use React. I can use them both in the same application there. And with Vue, with Vite, I'm able to compile things super, super fast, and it has a lot of nice little tools built into that. I can use that with React because I'm most comfortable with that. And so I'm the, the that's a very, very long way to say the things that I'm looking forward to the most are more of these tools that specifically solve one problem. So that way developers can kind of bring their toolkit and just improve incrementally what they build with at a time. Yeah, no, I totally, I can totally relate to that idea of like, tools that do one thing and do it extremely well. I mean, the whole Unix mm -hmm. philosophy has this idea, right? And, and it creates for yeah. so much uh, potential for composability between these different things. Now, what domains uh, are you seeing lagging the most behind in the Jamstack sort of philosophy and ecosystem? Ooh, that's, it, that's hard to say because, hmm, let me think. Because so everything first is so all, amazing. Yeah, everything is spectacular. Well, and, and especially just with all the announcements between Prisma Day today and then uh, Shopify did an event yesterday. And there's all these events that have been happening. Like I think e-commerce is growing a ton and media management is growing a ton. There's there's a lot of, of really, really cool things. Um, I think... I think what would be interesting is more of an advance in the real time area of, of, of uh, APIs and stuff. Like I, I know there's some really cool tools like Supabase has been growing a ton and, and, uh, and even a lot of our database tools have been growing a ton. But I, I think it'd be interesting to see more advancements in the WebSocket space and, and any sort of real-time thing where you can still do a lot of that compilation up front, but get real-time data better. I, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Absolutely. Um, we also had some questions from the audience. I believe one of them was uh, partially answered, but perhaps you could chime in too. So Jonathan K asked, so if you wanted to use Prisma with auth on Netlify, could you run Prisma client on an, in a Netlify function? Short answer, yes. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty dang sure that you can. If I recall, there's actually documentation in Prisma or, or like a guide for something like that. Um, yeah, so we yes. have a guide, a deployment guide okay. to Netlify. However, um, I don't believe so. Netlify also offers some kind of an authentication system, if I remember correctly. And I'm not sure. Yeah. I, I don't believe that the guide does that. But it would be interesting to create an example for that. Yeah, it would be interesting to play with that. Maybe that's something that you and I can work on together, Daniel. Because yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we we do have Netlify Identity Works and that uses GoTrue, the, the open source um, authentication library. And so I, I'm sure we could do something interesting with that. Um, yeah, but uh, totally possible for sure. Great, so uh, Cassidy. I want to thank you once again for sharing your experience in this really approachable talk. Um, it's been a pleasure having you here and uh, you were also the last talk for today. So uh, I really wish you a nice evening or morning, depending on where you're joining us from. And I hope to see you soon. And uh, I'm sure we can get something going with that Prisma with Netlify off going. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Daniel, and, and to the whole team here. And, and also, I, I'm sure you'll get plenty of kudos, but I want to say you've been doing an awesome job, Daniel, at emceeing, and I know how difficult a job that is. And so thank you so much for guiding the ship on this one. Much appreciated.